Ladies and gentlemen, Chair, I would like to present our study from the UK entitled Length of Barrett's Esophagus in the Presence of Low-Grade Dysplasia, High-Grade Dysplasia and Adenocarcinoma. The authors have no disclosures to make. It is well acknowledged that esophageal adenocarcinoma is rapidly growing in incidence worldwide, more so in Western countries, and is related to the increasing prevalence of reflux disease in the general population. Long-standing gastroesophageal reflux disease and resultant Barrett's esophagus are known precursors of esophageal adenocarcinoma, predisposing factors of, for conversion of Barrett's into adenocarcinoma are increasing age, male gender, obesity, and increasing length of Barrett's esophagus. Progression of Barrett's esophagus follows the classic pattern, often slowly, of developing low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and adenocarcinoma. Having established this, surveillance of Barrett's is vital in diagnosing these tumours early, or, more favourably, diagnosing them at the dysplastic stage. To this effect, the American College of Gastroenterologists and the British Society of Gastroenterologists have public, published authoritative guidelines. These focus on shorter surveillance intervals for longer segments of Barrett's esophagus due to the perceived risk of progression with long segment Barrett's. Both guidelines completely ignore Barrett's less than one centimetre, and both guidelines concede that this is based on evidence of poor quality. Barrett surveillance has been in practice for several decades due to the perceived prognostic and assumed survival advantage in surveillance detected cancers. But is Barrett surveillance actually working? Survival advantage could be due to lead and length time bias. Adenocarcinoma is uncommon in patients on surveillance, often taking 200 patient years of surveillance to diagnose one cancer. More so, only 3-8% to of esophageal adenocarcinoma is diagnosed from surveillance. Clearly, Barrett surveillance is not working. Is it because we're focusing too much on long segment Barrett's? Now this next slide is really important in understanding the premise of our study. In this schematic, we have stomach, lower down in pink, and esophagus with a long segment of Barrett's in purple. Now, if longer length of Barrett's esophagus was a true precursor for esophageal adenocarcinoma, then tumours would appear higher up in a long segment, or they'd be long tumours. Alternatively, they could be focal tumours close to the GEG, with a long segment of Barrett's above. In practice, however, we find a substantial proportion of cancers and dysplasia close to the GEG without any Barrett's above it. Our study aims to chart the length of Barrett's when low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia and adenocarcinoma arise in Barrett's and to identify the topographic location of adenocarcinoma and non-dysplastic Barrett's. This was a retrospective analysis of consecutive cases of dysplastic Barrett's, adenocarcinoma in Barrett's and non-dysplastic Barrett's at a regional upper GI cancer centre in the United Kingdom. In group one, we included all cases with a histological diagnosis of low-grade or high-grade dysplasia in Barrett's. In group two, we had 100 consecutive adenocarcinomas. And in group three, we analysed 100 consecutive non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus identified by a single endoscopist from 438 consecutive gastroscopies. This table summarises the features of the three groups of data included in the study a series of dysplastic Barrett's, a series of adenocarcinoma, and a series of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. The study period for each is identified here. In group one, we excluded indeterminate or squamous dysplasia and patients who'd had previous ablative therapy. In group two, we excluded Seawort 3 type tumours, and in the non-dysplastic Barrett's group, we excluded an irregular Z-line. We identified Barrett's according to the BSG guideline as columnar lined esophagus above the GEG. Cases were classed as ultra short if length was less than one centimetre, short segment if length was less than three centimetres, and long segment when length was above three centimetres. 
cases within a regular Z line were excluded. And an, and an example of this is shown here. The irregular Z line was defined when columnar epithelium above the GEJ remained below the level of the highest gastric fold. And these cases were excluded from the diagnosis of ultra short segment barriers. So for our results, in the 160 patients with dysplasia, 99 cases of low grade dysplasia and 61 cases of high grade dysplasia were analysed. As you can see here, a substantial proportion of dysplasia was diagnosed in Barrett's less than one centimetre or less than three centimetres. Overall, around one fifth was present in, Bar in Barrett's less than one centimetre and over 40% less than three centimetres from the GEJ. Now, this is another key slide in our results from the group of patients with dysplasia. A large proportion was dysplasia diagnosed on index endoscopy, commonly for reflux symptoms or just dysphagia, rather than while on Barrett surveillance. When diagnosed, a proportion had no visible lesions in comparison with those who had ulcers or nodules, for example. Now, if you look at the sub group with Barrett's less than one centimetre. The majority of the dysplasia was diagnosed on index endoscopy with no visible lesions in the columnar line esophagus. We had similar results on analysing the adenocarcinoma group with one fifth within one centimetre from the GEJ and 40% within three centimetres of the GEJ. We acknowledge that the absence of Barrett's concurrently with adenocarcinoma means that the cancer has overgrown into the entire Barrett's. Having said that, of the 100 cases analysed, 23 cases did have concurrent Barrett's. Again, most of them were short segments with tumours close to the GEJ, with only seven cases where Barrett's extended above the tumour. Of these seven cases, only one case had a short tumour less than three centimetres from the GEG with a long segment Barrett's above it. Careful assessment of consecutive columnar lined esophagi showed that over 50% of non-dysplastic Barrett's occurred within one centimetre of the GEG with over three centimetres occurring within three centimetres of the GEG. In summary, our data demonstrates that two thirds of dysplasia in Barrett's is diagnosed on index endoscopy and 46% occur within three centimetres of the GEJ. One fifth of esophageal adenocarcinoma occurs within one centimetre of the GEJ. And looking at non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, over 50% is less than one centimetre from the GEJ. This would lead us to postulate that the current system of Barrett surveillance will not pick up a proportion of adenocarcinoma and dysplasia as columnar lined epithelium less than one centimetre is disregarded from diagnosis and surveillance. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, chair, a substantial proportion of dysplasia and adenocarcinoma occur in ultra short or short segment Barrett's, often found on index endoscopy. We propose that all lengths of columnar lined epithelium above the GEJ when seen on endoscopy are recognized as Barrett's esophagus and subjected to a thorough biopsy protocol not accepting the diagnosis of one centimeter columnar line epithelium above the gastroesophageal junction as Barrett's may well be the reason why long segment Barrett's esophagus is considered a greater risk factor for adenocarcinoma. Thank you very much. <laughs>